slide, the side flash over, flames come out the door. That's their definition. It's about one megawatt fire when that happens. So here you can see the different results. We put them on this plot now, which is a correlation, has some theory behind it. I won't get into it, but it has TRP, HRP, total energy, heat flux represented of that test. That heat flux is driven by the burner in that test. And there's values for that. You can see what it is here. Again, curiosity is about 60. Where in UL, it's a laminar flame. This is a turbulent flame against the wall. It's just coincidental that they're about the same value. Just coincidental. Uh, here's some theoretical curves that we got. Uh, but you, you can see here that this empirical limit, I, I guess these, these, these are empirical. This, this is theoretical, the blue. So the blue is the theoretical based on similar limits that I told you of ignition, burning, and in this case, upward spread for turbulent flame. Here you can see just empirical designations between very fast flashover, medium flashover, longer flashover, no flashover. If you look at no flashover and flashover, you can see this curve here is doing a good separation. You would say, in the least, we have a correlation now between this parameter and this, given by this curve that separates no flashover from flashover. That's nice results for someone to know. Why do you have to do the full-scale test to find that out? You don't. From this, you could use this result, measure these properties in the cone calorimeter, plot it on here, see where your point comes out. If you don't like it, try to move it. Which way can you move it? Maybe you can add something that will change the HRP, heat of combustion. And now you can see how it will change on this diagram. So you can use it for development of your test to now pass this. So now it won't be a fire hazard, but it only won't be a fire hazard if you have a fire and it's in the corner and it's just like the ISO room corner test. If it's in this room, it's something else. But the regulators know how to tell us that. We as scientists don't know how to figure it out yet. That's, that's a facetious comment. So, uh, anyway, I will stop here. And uh, this is a nice picture of the Atlantic Ocean uh, on the other side. So, thank you very much. Are there questions or no time? Or materials because they're all products 
used in this study. And all of that data is taken by Scott Dillon, uh, more representative of those materials. So they're complex materials giving you an average, you know, uh, representation of their properties. Now, if you try to do that by, uh, by DSC, you, you won't get all the pieces. If you try to do that by a fitting process, I, I don't know what you'll get because you have to not model the char and, the, and, and delamination and other things. But when you met, do it from the cone, you, you're, you're getting something global. And I say it's, it's good enough. If some type body wants to do it better, fine. But don't ignore, you know, the past. Particularly if you're a FM and Archie Force have worked his whole life to get this data. <laughs> so Well, since nobody else is going to ask, I will. Um, do you think we're going the wrong way then with uh, where we're heading with our model? Should we be looking at simpler? Well, look, uh, I have nothing against CFP modeling. In fact, I'm going to give uh, Jennifer Wayne's talk later. But uh, I think the fire community, uh, particularly young people getting into it, are enthralled by computer models like that. Instead of going back to the physics, and trying to model things uh, specifically, uh, either by a model that targets those, that phenomena, or by experimental methods that allow you to correlate the data. Correlations that have been developed in fire used to be called fire modeling. Now computer modeling is called fire modeling. But they're all fire modeling. And the correlations to me are much more valuable because I challenge a computer model to go back and reproduce the correlation. And when that's done, it doesn't work. And so I don't think it's the wrong direction, but I, I think that uh, people should have a balance. And I think that the new people into this field are computer models, you know, have a balance. I think that your last line about having a balance is exactly the right point. I think that uh, computer models are, uh, I think they're brilliant, it's a brilliant development. Uh, you said, uh, almost ironically, that FM doesn't trust FBS. I think that's really not the case. I think the fact is that it is an evolving science, and I think it's more about proper usage of the models and actually uh, having uh, you know, the models being right or wrong. I think they're developing tools, let's put it that way. Uh, I you're think that you're uh, always such a diplomat. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim, but I'm not going to be so diplomatic like oh, okay. that. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I think that, that in, in the balance is a key, and I think that uh, one of the uh, concerns that I have when I see you presenting this work is that all of a sudden you have synthesized and presented the entire fire problem solved on the basis of a number of correlations that uh, you forget that what is behind those correlations requires an incredibly deep understanding of the physics of the problem. And you presented and simplified in a way such that it seems almost as a trivial output no. of a very rapid thought. No. And, uh, and I really think that it is in the limitations of this type of analysis where the key lies. And I think if we forget that all these things have boundaries and limitations, then we're going to use this as bad as we use the fine models, sure. and your balance is going to be completely lost. Absolutely right. Yeah, because, you know, uh, Fire safety uh, falls on new technology. Old things don't capture the new technology. So you invent some new products or something that do something different than the models that you conceive when you got these correlations, and it totally won't fit. So yes, absolutely. <coughs> You 
were compelled to say something. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, yeah, I just say my piece, I guess. Um, just one thing in terms of the, the, the actual properties of TRP, HRP, uh, that Archie uh, developed and measured. That's not something that we're trying to dismiss at all. Okay. Uh, I guess the, the, the point of the, the article that you, you referenced to is that in terms of having a computer model that is predictive and you know, s s setting aside the issue of you know, predicting flash over, predicting spread, which is some kind of a, like a global parameter, which you can you know, represent as you, as you uh, show here by the TRP, HRP, and so on. But if we're trying to have a computer model in which every, in every grid cell we're trying to uh, you know, predict hit flux, uh, paralysis, the amount of paralysis that's there, soot, and so on. And we're trying to do this through models that to some degree simplify the mathematics and the physics in, 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 in the actual process itself, which you have to do to some degree. Then these properties may not be applicable because they, they, it, the model cannot truly represent all the physics that are there. So you, to some degree you have to have an effective set of properties. Okay, let me back up. Yes. Heat of combustion will still be applicable. Yeah, I'm not talking about heat of Total energy there will still be uh, uh, applicable. Right. All right. Uh, critical heat flux uh, should be applicable, but maybe you use it in a different way. So right. now, now you've come to the heat of gasification versus your paralysis model, which, fair enough, <coughs> one is going to give you results over time, the other will True. give you an, an integrated time average. Yes. It doesn't preclude you from using that as a second alternative in your model. Right, right. And, we, and, and, we and then if you have a very complicated material, there may be some advantage <coughs> using one over the other because your fitting routine may give you real, you know, funny results for complicated materials. And that's true, but yeah. the fact is that we're using that model that we use in the fitting routine right. in the actual full computation. Right, right. So if we actually plug in a, you know, the next call it, you know, the, the true heat of gasification into the model, it might give us a completely different, a completely... Why don't you try it and see? Okay. That's, the, see, we'll try. see, you say you're not ignoring, I'm not ignoring, but you're not, because you're not using that in this try it and see as, okay. you know, part A and B. Sure, sure. And, and then I will feel good, and probably Archie doesn't care anymore because he's too tired. So. <laughs> but you know, in terms also of, of the experiment itself, when you measure heat of gasification, right. you know, on those experiments, there is some degree of uh, heat absorption by the paralysis gas, which is not taken into account. So the actual heat yes. flux reaching the surface is less than what is. But your model out. predicts the heat flux. Heat. No, we don't predict the heat flux. We the heat flux is an input to the model, to oh. the paralysis model. But your computer model when you well in the full in the full simulation yes yes yes, yes. yes. so he's using the slope that assumed all of that was constant and you're taking one point one test you, you see that if, <coughs> I say just try it okay <laughs> what, do you have to, what do you have to lose oh, your, your, boss three may, days. your boss may not like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs>